We're thrilled to welcome back to campus uh, one of our great alums, um, Alex Sheppelman um, at NASA. Um, we became familiar with some of um, Alex's work, actually from, from an article um, written by the Alumni Association with some cool stuff that he was doing on YouTube, and we're so thrilled to welcome him to the speaker series. Um, Jim Horwitz, who is in uh, Chagrin Falls, Ohio, um, and uh, is actually running an a entrepreneurial idea through our Remote Entrepreneurship Project program this summer, which is great, um, and is active with a lot of things. Entrepreneurship on our campus is going to be our student moderator. If you're joining us on Zoom and you, uh, you have a question for Alex during um, today's session, just let Jim know either by raising your hand or putting it in the chat. And if you're watching on LinkedIn Live, um, just put a question in the comment bar and then we'll be sure to feed it to Jim. So sorry we're starting a few minutes late. Um, welcome, Alex, and over to you, Jim. All right, Alex, so we got to talk a little bit. You have a very exciting story. So why don't we kick it off um, with some of your education, like how you ended up at Case um, and maybe any of your education afterwards. Sure. Yeah. So uh, again, thank you so much for for having me on. It's it's great to be back and you know interact with the with the case community. So uh, from the intro, again, my name is Alex Shuppelman. I'm currently a uh, robotics and computational modeling engineer at NASA Glenn Research Center, uh, working on uh, some of the upcoming uh, Moon and Mars rovers. I graduated from Case uh, in 2009 with a bachelor's and in 2010 with a master's in mechanical engineering, uh, where I worked on autonomous lawnmowers and uh, vision uh, related projects there uh, in Roger Quinn's lab. And then after that, I uh, attended a, a grad school for my PhD at Carnegie Mellon, where I worked on humanoid robots and uh, uh, essentially building robotic legs to test prosthesis controllers, so for foot placement and, and walking. Uh, and then after that, I was uh, a postdoc at a startup for about a year, uh, after which I moved back to Cleveland uh, with my family, uh, my wife, uh, who's also a, a case alum, and uh, then started working at a local aerospace contractor before uh, finally or most recently transitioning over to NASA uh, about a year ago. So. Yeah, that's great to hear. So you seem like you have a very strong foundation in robotics in NASA. Could you just elaborate a little bit more on what you do at NASA or how you, I understand that NASA, or from what I understand at least, NASA is very difficult to get a job at. Um, so just elaborate on kind of that process and how you ended up at NASA. Uh, sure. So, uh, so when we moved back to Cleveland, I uh, first started working as a uh, contractor at Zinn Technologies. So they uh, collaborate with a lot of, of NASA projects, uh, specifically hardware and build related projects. And uh, kind of through uh, uh, the work there, uh, became aware of some of the robotics work uh, going on at, at Glenn. And um, basically at that point, it was a kind of a standard application process. So there's a, a website called USA Jobs uh, that you can check for open positions. Um, and about a year ago, actually, uh, a position opened up in the mechanisms and tribology branch because they were looking for some help uh, on some of the projects that they're working on right now, uh, specifically the Viper rover uh, that will be launching soon uh, to explore for uh, volatiles and, and water ice on the lunar surface, as well as the uh, Mars Spring tire project. So uh, that opportunity just seemed like the perfect way to, you know, one, uh, stay in Cleveland, obviously, uh, for a robotics related, related job, and then also just do some really cool work. So uh, I jumped at the opportunity, was you know, excited that I was selected for an interview, uh, and then I kind of went, went through the standard interview process, and I'm really happy, I guess, uh, that it worked out, uh, just because right now, uh, definitely a lot going on uh, with the kind of reinvigoration of the U.S. space program, especially with the, with the Artemis program. So we're looking to uh, kind of establish a, a permanent moon base, essentially, and obviously uh, land the, the first woman and the next man on the moon, uh, hopefully by 2024 on the lunar surface. So uh, lots to do and some really exciting work going on that I'm really happy to be able to contribute to. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. So in addition to this, you've also managed to create and run your own YouTube channel. Um, why don't you just give a brief introduction to YouTube and maybe a little bit what you do on your channel specifically? Sure. So uh, YouTube, I guess I'm, I'm sure, you know, as the audience knows, it's basically a, a gigantic video hosting platform for any type of video under the sun, you know, from kind of mountains of cat videos and other animal videos to, you know, live streams and uh, kind of a 
uh, more niche topic that has been growing on YouTube, which is kind of like the, the maker community. So um, a lot of content creators there uh, working on things like 3D printing and really exploring kind of science and technology. Um, and, and within that space, I guess it, those videos I found kind of existed on a spectrum. So there's like the really kind of highly technical programming tutorials, you know, where you like screen capture and you watch a guy code and like he'll explain his code. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have more like the, the science entertainment videos. So for example, like Mark Rober, which is really kind of accessible um, to, the, to the general public. So kind of what, what I was aiming for with, with my YouTube channel is to kind of have a mix of both. So to be able to, you know, communicate kind of some good uh, engineering knowledge or computer science knowledge, but then also make it entertaining. Um, and that's kind of how, how uh, the channel Super Make Something came to be. So it started off really in grad school um, when, you know, I was looking to be able to kind of explore different technologies that maybe weren't directly related to my research or maybe that I was looking to explore further before I could apply them to my research. And I wanted to find a way to uh, kind of document those. And I know a lot of people kind of do blogs and things like that. Um, but I, I, I've always felt that, at least for me, I'm more of a visual learner. So, you know, having like a, a video reference or having somebody really uh, explain something like that to you uh, kind of visually with, with video examples uh, and kind of narration, I've always found uh, to be a bit more helpful. And uh, I guess I, I kind of got practice in doing that uh, when I was actually a student at Case. So uh, during the last two summers that I was there, I was the instructor for Engineering 131, uh, which was at the time the intro to programming course for, for Java and really enjoyed that, that experience. So I basically decided to take what I learned from, from teaching the class there and then wanting to kind of explore these topics and document them uh, to create this, this YouTube channel. And that was about, uh, I started about six years ago. So it's been growing uh, steadily ever since. And kind of as you know, more people have joined, I guess the, the production value goes up a little bit and the, the projects get larger and larger. So uh, now it's kind of a, a catch all for any kind of topic that I find interesting uh, that you know I personally want to explore more. I figure that sharing the knowledge will uh, you know help hopefully get people inspired to explore engineering, science, math, uh, anything, and kind of make technology itself seem that it's more accessible and really show that it doesn't have to be hard. Um, and that's that's kind of where Super Make Something is now. So you know just a hopefully a good starting point for those uh, looking to make cool stuff, but not really maybe knowing how to get into it. Uh, just kind of seeing a video, seeing that it isn't hard or doesn't have to be as intimidating as you might see, you know, like in a, in a college classroom or, or something like that. Uh, and hopefully, you know, people learn something cool along the way. Yeah, that's great to hear. I mean, I, I really got my start in engineering because of people like you, because I, I did exactly that. I just searched YouTube for, you start at the, the STEM side of that's really approachable. And then as you get more familiar with it, people can can kind of progress down this path of getting more and more technical all, all on their own. Mm -hmm. um, it's really amazing. Yeah, so, exactly. And that's also like a, a, a comment that, I guess the, the best kind of comments I feel like I get on the channel are, you know, either one, like I'll make this or two, you know, I didn't realize that it was kind of that easy to get started and which is, which is always awesome because I mean, you know, for, for me, I guess personally in the channel, I build projects that are interesting to me personally, but probably the, the vast majority of people, you know, that watch the videos probably won't go on to build exactly the project that I built because they probably have things, you know, that they're interested in, but at least to be able to provide a starting point and maybe some code that people can, you know, look at and kind of understand and then maybe modify to fit their needs. Uh, those are always for me, I guess, personally, the, the most rewarding comments just to see that I've inspired somebody to, you know, pick up a microcontroller or get into 3D printing or, or something like that. So. Yeah, for sure. It looks like we have a question here from Grant Goodrich. What is the age range that you normally target for your videos? Yeah, good question. So typically, I think I, I try to target an age range of maybe 16 and up. So um, a lot of my projects kind of go through the whole project design cycle. So for example, uh, like a, a good example um, that we can see here, it's uh, a project that I built called the NeoPixel Mirror. And basically it starts kind of at the CAD level where I, uh, you know, design the parts and then walks through uh, kind of manufacturing the parts, the electronics and things like that. 
Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm really aiming for a kind of a, maybe a, the, the teenage level and up. So people that, you know, might have access to this technology, either maybe through a local makerspace or a library or have a 3D printer at home. I'm really kind of hoping to catch uh, them, you know, at around the, the maybe high school, like college age range where, you know, they can say like, oh, wow, like this is something cool that I want to explore um, and, and hopefully get into. So I guess YouTube does provide statistics though, like of the kind of age range of your typical audience. Um, it seems like most of my viewers are within the 25 to, to 34 range. So uh, I guess what I take that to mean is, you know, that maybe people that, uh, you know, went to college or want to maybe kind of broaden their horizons a bit, maybe for their jobs and things like that, are looking to kind of pick up something new um, and, and find my channel that way. So that, that, you know, being able to do that is also, is also super cool. So... Yeah, I'm just I'm just looking at this, this this video here. That's really cool. So this is a so I understand NeoPixels are individually addressable LEDs that can be any color, and then you can turn them on and off. But mm -hmm. can you just kind of describe what this project here is in a little bit more detail? Sure. So uh, basically, this uh, project started off uh, as I guess being a being an interactive art piece. So uh, during my time at CMU, I was in a systems engineering class and that's really where I was exposed to kind of Arduinos and microcontroller programming. And the, the final project for that class was to create some kind of interactive exhibit for the Pittsburgh Children's Museum. And uh, what we ended up building was a harmonograph where it was basically a, a robot arm where uh, people could adjust dials to change the frequencies and it would basically make these different spirograph patterns. Um, but, you know, as, as part of that class, uh, we were allowed to take a tour of the museum before it opened. And one of the coolest exhibits they had at, at the museum was this mechanical mirror uh, by an artist named Daniel Rosen. And what it was, it was essentially, uh, it had a camera in the middle and then a bunch of uh, metallic and wooden plates on a servo. And then based on, you know, what the camera was picking up, basically, that wall of, of wood uh, actuated by the servos would change to reproduce the image. So this is kind of what I was trying to do here, but in a, in a more digital form. So um, basically there's a, there's a camera in the middle uh, and then uh, NeoPixel strips that you see or that you saw previously um, behind. And depending on the brightness that the camera picks up, it'll basically light up those NeoPixels uh, kind of at that appropriate brightness to, to reproduce the image. And, uh, you know, it's, it was really cool, especially this, uh, this project, because I finished it right in time for the uh, last Cleveland Maker Fair that, that uh, was held at the Great Lakes Science Center before everything shut down for COVID. And the, the response that I got on, on that video for people that saw the exhibit live and then, uh, you know, visited the, the video and downloaded the code and all the design files uh, to, you know, either try to build one their own or maybe explore uh, kind of NeoPixels and programming uh, kind of by themselves uh, was, was really cool. So that's definitely the, the type of project that I, that I typically uh, aim to, I guess, aim to build, so. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> yeah, that's great to hear. Oh my gosh, one second. Anyway, yeah, that's great to hear. Uh, that's a really cool project and definitely something that, that I would have clicked on and, and built my, or tried to build myself. Um, so we have a we have another question here from Grant. Um, we hear about YouTube stars getting big sponsorships. Do you have any experience with sponsorships, or are you funded? Uh, yeah. So um, over time, as the as the channel grew, uh, I've been approached by more and more companies to um, you know kind of re review their product and maybe featured on my channel. And I guess in in my experience, so typically. There is kind of two types of companies. Uh, so one are just ones that, you know, they want product reviews. I know product review videos are, are really cool on YouTube. Um, but for me, I guess what I found is that, you know, in the spirit of kind of like the maker channel, that's, that's not necessarily really a good fit for me. So the type of uh, companies that I, that I work with uh, for sponsorships are usually kind of manufacturers of things like 3D printers or laser cutters. Um, or I'm uh, also partnered with a, a PCB uh, fab house uh, in China. Um, and the idea there is to kind of, you know, be able to, to use the products they send or the services they offer to like and integrate that into a project. So again, so not that it's just like a standalone commercial, which, you know, people might not necessarily get anything out of if they're just kind of browsing YouTube. 
but really to kind of, again, take a technology and apply it so that, you know, even if people maybe don't necessarily use that same fabrication house or maybe don't necessarily use that same printer, um, hopefully they'll be able to take, you know, one or two lessons away from it so that, you know, when they do maybe go design their own circuit boards or, you know, they are in the market maybe for a 3D printer later on down the line, they'll at least have some kind of basic information uh, of things to look for and kind of how to get started. Yeah, I, I, can, I can relate to that a ton too because I would always watch videos and I really got into 3D printing because of YouTube videos and all those montages of they keep the the, the nozzle the, the same in the same place and then it right. rides uh -huh. like those really cool time lapses. And um, of course, I didn't. I never really paid attention to the printer itself. While the companies that sponsor you, I'm sure want want the audience sure. to. Um, <laughs> just exposing people to technology is is really awesome. Yeah, and I, and I find you know the 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 companies that I I do partner with. I guess it's kind of like a, you know back and forth. Like it's because it is a relationship. I guess to to work with different companies and to kind of establish a good working relationship. So I think compared to um, kind of typical YouTubers that maybe produce content more frequently, maybe those that are doing it full time. I mean, for me, you know, even though it, it has grown over the years, I guess it is still mostly a, a hobby and a way to explore um, technology. So my, my upload frequency maybe isn't as high as maybe some other YouTubers out there. But uh, I think the, the companies, at least that, that I've partnered with, really seem to like that and also seem to really want to kind of further education and just want to make sure that people become aware of different technologies out there. Um, so it's definitely, it's definitely been a good match. And I'm happy to, you know, to have been able to find those companies. So. Yeah. So, so when these companies approach you, are they, do you have to like <laughs> send them a draft video and then they come back and say, yes, you showed our company and our product in the right light or how, how does stuff like that work? Yeah, so at the beginning, um, it did it did start off that way. So um, especially when I didn't have quite as many videos, you know, basically sending them a demo and saying like, okay, this is how you would be integrated, and this is kind of the the general flow of how the videos work. Um, since it's grown, I've actually found that you know companies kind of approach me usually via email and say, hey, like we have this new printer coming out, um, would you be interested in featuring it in your video? And then, you know, now at this point, I guess, because I have a few examples, I can basically send them a link to existing YouTube videos and they can kind of see how everything would get integrated and, and how they would be featured. So uh, that's definitely an advantage, I think, to, you know, probably the same with anything, like starting something and sticking with it for a long time. Uh, you just kind of have like this big library of like previous projects to reference, which just makes stuff like that um, a lot easier, I guess, to do. So. Mm -hmm. so, so do you find that you're getting like companies shipping products to you? Yeah, so um, usually, <coughs> excuse me, um, so usually the sponsorships are kind of one of, of two ways. So sometimes um, there's financial sponsorships. So especially for things like, you know, fabrication services, things like that, um, that help me cover production costs. And then kind of the other side of it is, is like company, exactly like you said, so companies, you know, will send me a machine um, that might have some kind of new capability that I didn't have before. And I have a project idea in mind and we kind of partner that way. And then um, in addition to that, uh, kind of that gets tagged on uh, kind of with affiliate links, both through Amazon and through the, uh, through the manufacturer potentially themselves. So, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a, a mix of, of both. Um, I, I will say that kind of, and this is kind of nice for the, the project type video that I do instead of review videos. So uh, because I'm not really ever looking to provide a, a review or like do a commercial, um, and I really, you know, use all the products kind of in my video, um, it's, it's really nice that I'm kind of able to really express kind of my, my true opinions about a machine that I might receive. So, you know, if I say like, oh, something's good, like I, I really do like it versus, you know, if, if, if something's maybe not so good, if there could be, you know, some improvements because there's not necessarily a kind of an exchange of, of money that way, I'm not really kind of forced by the company to, to say anything good. And I, and I think, you know, that's kind of nice from, from that perspective, again, just because it, it it's, it's kind of uh, like honest in that sense. And, and it's also nice to be able to provide that feedback because, you know, if something doesn't work, that manufacturer can then go, okay, well then for the next version, you know, we know to fix A, B, and C. Um, and then hopefully that also results in a better, better product. And again, people will hopefully, you know, know what to look for. So for example, um, with 3D printers, um, when, when I first started, I guess my, my first printer was a printer bot simple. So it was basically uh, 
plywood laser cut pieces and fishing line for the belts with some drums. And uh, compared to, you know, the printers that you can get now for significantly less money, I mean, they have heated beds and auto bed leveling and filament detection to see, you know, if a filament breaks or if there's a power outage, it can resume. And stuff like that, I think it's, it's really important to have things like being able to have honest reviews to be able to say like, look, like this is a good printer, but it's really missing a critical feature that exists in these other machines that might be, you know, available for a better price. So if, if somebody is really looking to get into 3D printing, I want to make sure that, you know, they don't just buy a machine that I feature in a video, but I really want to make sure that they kind of get the most information that they can to be able to make their own decisions so that they're really not limited by the machine that they buy, but they can really focus on the engineering and the implementation and the project that they're looking to do, not so, so that it doesn't impede like their learning or turn them off, you know, from engineering or science and things like that. So. Yeah, definitely. We have a question here from Francis asking what upcoming interests you may have or upcoming things that you find Cool. Yeah. So, uh, so I think I said earlier, kind of as, as the channels grown and as I've kind of gotten access to more resources to make stuff, my, my, my video scope has also grown a little bit. So, um, kind of my most recent project, um, was to build this uh, streaming controller for live streams called the stream deck. And that was kind of a whole, um, kind of 3d printed, uh, electrical engineering integration project. And, and that really seemed to be really well received because again, it showed the audience kind of the, the whole kind of life cycle of what it takes to from like in, having an idea uh, for a project and then seeing it through to completion. Uh, so my next project that I'm actually working on uh, is an open source robotics actuator. So uh, what I found kind of in the hobby market, there's kind of two main like avenues of things that people can buy to get into robotics projects. So it's either kind of these hobby servos, you know, which are, which are pretty good for some things, or there's kind of on the other end, like these really expensive motion controllers um, that are like fully integrated with, with feedback controls and things like that. Um, but there's really kind of nothing in the middle. So either, you know, if somebody wants to build a robotics project, like the, the actuator isn't maybe powerful enough to do what they want, or maybe it's too expensive um, to kind of, actually allow them to build the robot that they want. Um, so the project that I'm currently working on is, is basically a, a DIY actuator where all of the parts or hopefully most of the parts can be 3D printed. Uh, there's a circuit board that you just need to solder together and then you can assemble everything. And the idea is to be able to kind of give these people a building block that they can use to build their own robot and then really go on and again, build a project that, that they're excited about. So that's the, that's the upcoming one. Um, kind of the, the intro to that project uh, is currently published on my YouTube channel. So that was actually in, in conjunction in partnership uh, with a PCB manufacturer. So uh, I guess I'm, I'm not an electrical engineer uh, kind of by, by trade. So um, really the only circuit kind of knowledge that I had formally was, was Dr. Merritt's uh, intro to circuits class at Case. Uh, so I'm definitely still, still learning along the way. And I, and I designed the circuit board and I posted it online and kind of without fail, I've never gotten such consistent feedback on anything that I've ever posted online. It was just a wall of text saying all my circuit board traces were too thin and I'm going to burn out the trace and it's going to be a fiery disaster. And kind of that, that made me think, I'm like, wow, you know, that's a good point. I've, I don't actually know how to do that. So um, I ended up making a video that uh, uses thermal imaging and kind of a redesign of the circuit board to really test and validate exactly how wide circuit board traces need to be. Um, and kind of that's, that's the first in the series of this DIY robotics actuator. So basically, you know, once, once I'm ready to have the build, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to reference that video and go back to say, look, here's a circuit board that's in this, this actuator. Here's how I designed it. Please go check out that video. Um, and then, you know, this, this next video will probably focus on the, the mechanical design and the, and the implementation. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. Um, I, I am also trying to get in circuit design and it's, it is a little, it is a little daunting. Uh, we've got another question here from Michael Grobberg. Feel free to unmute. Great. Right. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Alex. This is a great discussion. So, um, <laughs> being an early, someone who got in relatively early in the online teaching world with video, um, and I also actually had the, the opportunity to do it on Coursera and, and with the world. 
doing a lot of this over the last 14 months. Um, you know, what insights do you have on the video production side and sort of teaching online? And, you know, are there any kind of lessons from the pandemic as you saw? Um, and I'm sort of curious even on, on the impact in, in, in your viewership, um, you know, what happened over the last 14 months and then what are things sort of going forward that you'll kind of learn from that that you'll continue to sort of embrace as you produce, um, you know, exciting, exciting video content? Yeah, uh, that's a, that's a great question. So I think the the number one thing that that I've learned is that I think at the end of the day to to really kind of make the, the, I think the main purpose of the YouTube videos is really more than you know to teach everybody like the exact details of how everything is done. It's more to get them excited and and motivated. So I guess in terms of an editing perspective, that means trying to you know, keep everything at the right level of detail um, and maybe not make it necessarily even too dense, but just to make sure that the length um, is good and kind of moves at a, at a proper clip. Um, because I found that, and I, I'm guilty of this too, like when I, when I have a question and I'll go to YouTube and I'll, and I'll go to the internet, you know, I, I want to be able to find the answer right now. And if, if, you know, a certain source that I'm looking at doesn't give me that what I need, uh, you know, within the first minute or two, um, I'll try to I'll try to find another video that does. So I think that's definitely kind of from a video editing perspective, um, something I guess for, for me to be aware of and that I've kind of you know been working on since starting this channel. So to, to really try to find that right balance. And I know, I guess that kind of translates into a lot of backend work before the video is published. Um, so for me, I think I, I timed it generally to make about 60 seconds of video. Um, with the with the editing and the narration and things like that will take about maybe an hour to an hour and a half of, of work. And that's kind of in, in addition to actually building the project and, and doing the design work. So, uh, you know, definitely a lot of kind of back end work that people don't see. Uh, but again, I think it's worth it because, you know, then you do get those people kind of sitting through to the end, which um, is, is important, especially for my videos, just because it walks through that entire engineering process. And then I find that, you know, the ones that that do really sit through the entire thing and then you kind of bring it home right at the end and it clicks and you see how everything integrates together. Um, those are the the type of viewers I find that, you know, come back and and watch more videos and also, you know, share links with me on on Twitter or or Instagram about projects that that they've built themselves. So um, I think from from that perspective, definitely for kind of pre-produced video content. Um, that's a good rule of thumb. Uh, but I guess the other nice thing about uh, having having video content is you can definitely link it to a lot of different things online too. So um, so one of the other uh, items that I do on my YouTube channel, it's a video series called Super Make Something Basics. So in addition to the uh, projects that I build that you know might be kind of the the uh, the, the stream deck or the uh, open source actuator, um, these are maybe certain things that uh, don't necessarily fit into a project, but that are either useful or can be referenced um, to others. Uh, so for example, this video that I'm showing here is basically how to set up and train a neural network from scratch. Um, I have another one that basically shows up how to set up a Raspberry Pi for remote desktop access. And uh, one that's good for people kind of just looking for kind of, you know, standard information to use in their own projects. But similarly, it's also a good way to keep kind of my main project videos moving along at a good clip. Um, because if there is ever a, a time in a video where I have to set up a Raspberry Pi, I can just say, okay, hey, I check out this previous video that I did. Um, and that kind of keeps things, things moving along. And again, uh, like I said before, kind of that gets easier and easier, uh, the, the bigger kind of content library you have, so. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> we have another question from Francis here. Feel free to un unmute and introduce yourself. Alex. Oh, hello. How are you? <laughs> oh, I'm doing okay. Uh, you, you mentioned circuits, though, so I've yes. got to ask. <laughs> Alex uh, and I work together on his master's. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, uh, on the uh, robotic lawnmower. But uh, you made a really good comment about motivating people earlier. And what do you think of the way we currently teach engineering core courses? 
in light of the very different way that material is presented in YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's- Is there uh, a middle ground that we should actually be teaching the engineering courses in? Whew, so um, I guess, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, I, and I think the, the thing that I would have to draw from specifically is the time uh, when I taught uh, 131 and also when I TA'd the class uh, kind of from sophomore year through, uh, through my master's. And I, I found that for me personally, when, when teaching the, the class, again, the, the main kind of concept is to make sure that, you know, people are excited about it and that maybe after class they'll go and they'll, they'll, you know, explore the topic further. So at least for, for my projects, when I taught 131, so for example, when we were looking at, at for loops, um, I tried to relate that back to, um, how old arcade games used to uh, kind of have different character models where, you know, you might not have the storage to have different animations or different models, but they would basically swap the color of the characters. And then you would be able to kind of tell the difference between player one and player two. Um, and using, using that to kind of illustrate how a for loop works and kind of tying it back to something like real world that the audience knew um, and could get excited about and relate to, I think, and I think definitely helped. So I think from, from that perspective, uh, the, the classes that I enjoyed the most, I think, at CASE uh, were the ones with the lab components. So, you know, the, kind of in lecture, you would get introduced kind of this, this topic. And then in lab, you would be able to see like, okay, like everything I learned now can be applied to make this cool thing. And I think that's personally really motivating and probably for a lot of other people that, that also study engineering, uh, just to really have that hands-on time and just to be able to get started in, in making things. And I think that for me personally um, is, is, is always good. Uh, and similarly for my YouTube videos. So obviously it's a little bit different there kind of while presenting the material um, because you can't necessarily have hands-on time for the viewer kind of within the video. Um, but there it's really important maybe to show the buildup and to show how everything integrates together um, and then at the end, personally, what I do for all my, my project videos is I make sure that everything is always open source and available for free so that, you know, anybody that really wants to go afterwards and kind of explore a topic more, they'll have those resources available to them as a starting ground, again, just to keep them motivated and hopefully to get them to, you know, Google search like, oh, what is a transistor? Like, how can I use it? Or what is a microcontroller? How can I use that? Um, and I think that's, you know, that's kind of the, the main thing that I've found um, for, for for teaching in general. Okay, but more project rather than less structured lab. So, so for me personally, I think that's where the kind of the, the, the drive comes from. So, you know, if I have a project that I'm excited about and I, and I know that I wanna end up with something that does X, but I don't necessarily know how to get there, but you know, I can search my way through it I'll kind of pinball through various different topics and pick up all this information along the way that, you know, not only helps me uh, kind of finish the project that I'm working on, but then kind of for future projects, you know, now, for example, I know how to use a microcontroller or I know how to design things optimally for 3D printing. And you can kind of recycle that knowledge and kind of have this like library that you can draw on to make, you know, the next project mm -hmm. more exciting and bigger. And I, for me personally, that's always cool to kind of always raise the stakes and always build something newer and cooler and, and bigger. Yeah, sounds like engineering needs more motivational speakers like you <laughs> and Larry Sears, of course. Oh, yes, uh, absolutely. So, yeah, um, I, as, a, as a current engineering student, I definitely got my passion for engineering outside of the classroom through stuff like YouTube. Um, so I, I completely see, see the logic here. What else do we have? So I, I understand that for YouTube, there's there's sponsorships, and then there's also ways that you can make money per views with AdSense on YouTube. Could you just kind of elaborate how monetization on videos works? And maybe, I know a lot of YouTubers have a lot of issues with monetization sometimes, so maybe any encounters you've had with that? Sure, yeah, so uh, kind of, so like you had said, so sponsorships, things like that are usually external through YouTube. And then the, the big, I guess, economic engine that keeps the platform running uh, much to, you know, the, the dismay of maybe anybody searching for YouTube are the ads. So uh, those are kind of either like the little banner ads that you'll see on the side of a video or 
kind of the, the pre-roll or mid-roll ads where, you know, you'll be watching a video and then it'll just interrupt the video with a 15, 20 second commercial. And um, the way that that is monetized is essentially advertisers approach YouTube and then YouTube uh, uses kind of their machine learning backend to match the, uh, the content of a video to specific advertisers. And then based on your viewer engagement and how likely they are to one click on a video or two to sit through the ads and kind of how many likes or dislikes you have, um, YouTube dynamically calculates a uh, rate for uh, kind of what it would cost for an advertiser um, to kind of show your video uh, to a thousand people. And that's called a, a CPM. And um, basically that number changes on a per video and on a daily basis. Uh, but the, the idea is basically that if you have high engagement, kind of the, the advertising space that YouTube, uh, I guess, can, can sell that space on your video for is higher than something that might have lower engagement. And then there's a, a rate, for example, that's typically, you know, between three to $10 per thousand views um, that the advertiser will then pay YouTube. And then uh, kind of the, the content creator splits that with YouTube 50-50. Uh, and then uh, the idea that, you know, that's why you always kind of have people saying, please be sure to like and subscribe because that kind of shows the, the YouTube algorithm that there is high engagement for your video. Uh, and then also kind of the, the more that people watch your videos, uh, the more the more money that you make. And that's why you see, you know, some people like Mark Rober or these other people that have millions of YouTube subscribers and, uh, you know, they publish a video and it has like 800, 900,000 views in a day. Uh, that's, you know, definitely enough probably to make sure that they can, you know, do YouTube full time for, for a living. So I'm, I'm not personally there yet, um, but certainly I guess YouTube at this point is is nice because it's kind of self-sustaining. So uh, kind of per video, I, I make enough revenue to be able to invest kind of in my next project. Uh, and that's kind of cool because now it's kind of at this at this uh, spot where, you know, it, it's kind of self, self-perpetuating, which is really cool, so. Yeah, that's, that's really awesome. So just to wrap it up, where do, you, where do you see your future with YouTube? You know, you've been on it for a couple of years um, and YouTube's definitely not going anywhere. I don't know if, like maybe one day, if if you get if you get large enough, or you gonna switch to that full time, or I don't know if NASA is too cool. I wouldn't blame you. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. So I think so. Right now, you know, I'm I'm fortunate enough to kind of be able to do it kind of as a hobby and just use it as a way to again kind of explore technologies that are interesting to me and to be able to share that um, while 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 still having a a, a full time job. And, you know, I think, again, the, the way my channel is set up, um, it, I'm not necessarily in a schedule where I need to kind of come up with a new video maybe every week to make sure that I can survive and I can eat and have a place to sleep. And I, I really like that because it, um, it allows me to really take the time for each video and make sure that kind of the, the engineering knowledge and things that I can pass on through the video are kind of as concise and, and clear cut and easy to understand as possible. So I think in the future, you know, I, I definitely see myself still uh, creating videos just because I think even if YouTube went away, um, I'd find some other way to, to document my projects because I don't think I'll ever stop, you know, making things at home and making things that, that are cool to me because that's personally how I learn. Um, but definitely if, if there'd be an opportunity to you know, reach a wide audience to be able to say like, okay, maybe, you know, we can have this online Skillshare course or kind of this online university course where, you know, people, you know, would tune in to, you know, learn how to do a certain thing like programming and things like that. I think that's, that's definitely a place that I would like to be. So kind of going back to the, the engineering 131 roots of, of teaching that class, I think ultimately that's really something that I really enjoy doing. And, and just to be able to inspire people and, uh, you know, hopefully inspire the next generation of, of engineers and get them off on the right foot. Uh, I think that's, that's really cool. So I, I definitely hope that regardless of what happens, uh, I guess that, that keeps going. And hopefully as, as the channel grows, uh, more people will tune in and, you know, more people will decide that engineering is at least something that they want to look into exploring. Um, and I think that's, that's ultimately my, my goal. Yeah, well, that's that's great to hear. 
Well, Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure moderating this session and I'll, I'll throw it back to Michael. Ah, thank right. you so much. Jim, thank you for moderating. You did a great job. That was that was excellent. Alex, it's um, it really is inspiring to have you back on campus, at least virtually sharing what you're doing. Be careful what you wish for. I saw uh, Francis and others smiling when you were offering to help us think about whether it's a Case Western Reserve or other places. I mean, you know, the future of teaching and learning is evolving. And I think the kind of work that you're doing with your videos in, in short format um, and the way that people are getting the information. I mean, I think there's a lot that you're teaching us and there's a lot, I think, for those of us that are educators need to be thinking about um, how to better do to engage uh, a broader audience. So thanks for inspiring us. Thanks for the work. And yeah, yeah I look you. forward to continuing the conversation with you on these topics. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much again for inviting me. It's, it's great to be back. And I hope that, you know, once things open, back up and kind of return to whatever the new normal is, um, I'll be able to stop by uh, the think box and, you know, again, visit the facility and just see everything that's there because it's just such a, it's such a cool place. So Awesome. Well, we look forward to having you back and thank you everybody for joining. We'll be back next week with another uh, speaker series edition. Actually, we've got a, a father daughter intergenerational conversation between Michael and Lizzie Horowitz about um, venture capital and starting startups. I hope you can join us for that and for future events. So Alex and Jim, thank you again. Thanks everybody for joining. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.